As you know, each week we record the sessions and we admonish you to take lots of notes, right? Because we cover a lot of information in this short amount of time. And so I just want to say thank you to the 248 individuals that joined us last week. And I think about 40 of you uh, joined us on site at um, our musculoskeletal center. So, you know, the fourth Tuesday of every month, we're hybrid. So thank you to those individuals that joined us. Um, be on the lookout for all my emails with tons of links, the recording link, uh, registration for future programs. But we just want to thank you all for joining us and applaud your efforts as we kick off March with Dr. Jason Cobb. Okay, well, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cobb. And then if Dr. Parker can join us, that's great. But in the interim, we will have John at the end. So save your energy, but take lots of notes. Welcome, Dr. Cobb. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. And thanks for the invitation to Brain Talk. So I will talk about chronic kidney disease and also its relationship to Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. So you have your urinary symptom, system. Uh, we all have 99.9% .9 of us are born with two kidneys. You have your left kidney and your right kidney. Blood flows through the kidney, is filtered, toxins are removed, fluid is purified and also fluid is removed as appropriately. That leaves its urine from your kidney and goes down the ureter into your bladder then your urine is excreted. So just looking at the functional part of the kidney, the nephron. So each one of those kidneys have about a million of these nephrons uh, in the kidney. So you see blood flow filtered into the kidney, blood is filtered out, but toxins are removed, such as urea, creatinine, potassium. But then also fluid is removed and the filtered blood end up filtering back out into the body, but then urine is produced and it goes down to the ureter and to the bladder. So one of the things I just mentioned is the creatinine. This is how we measure your kidney function. We all have muscle mass at different degrees and creatine, creatine kinase is broken down to creatinine. And that's one of the toxins in your blood system. So creatinine, BUN or urea is another one we will talk about today. And we put this creatinine into these equations. So you have the cockroach gall equation, the MDRD equation, but the CKD epi equation. And this is the one that we use here at Emory, CKD epi. So we put this creatinine into this equation and it gives you your estimated GFR. So when you look at your labs, when you go see the doctor, you see your estimated GFR. I usually tell my patients, try to remember the estimated GFR. It is very hard to remember what your creatinine is. And also the creatinine differs between your body size, your age, your gender. So patients can remember because normal kidney function should be probably 100 millimeters per minute or 100% or more. So patients can remember the GFR, remember their percent kidney function. So I tell all my patients that GFR, they can remember they have 30% kidney function or 50% kidney function. Something I want to highlight, the MDRD equation and the CKD epi equation, and now we use the CKD epi equation, had a variable, a modifier for African-American patients. So here at Emory and our kidney function reporting, we changed in 2021. So I, you used to have a serum creatinine in your lab value. It would know in the computer what your race is and it will say none African-American or African-American. And the African-American patient always had a higher kidney function because of the modifier in the estimated GFR. I'm on the, I was on the American Society of Nephrology, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee, and we have worked really hard to get rid of this and made recommendations for centers to only report one kidney function because this definitely led to disparities when it comes to African-American patients because we use this estimated GFR to make decisions in nephrology about how to treat our patients. So now at Emory, so this is probably 2020 or 2021, this example here, but since the summer of 2021 at Emory now, there's only one report. Everybody's reported 
with the non-African American number. Now it's just a number for everyone in our kidney function reporting. So chronic kidney disease is defined as abnormalities of kidney structure or function present for at least three months. Anything shorter than that, we are called acute kidney injury. Where implications for health and chronic kidney disease is classified into the cause. So what's the type of your chronic kidney disease? Your GFR category, where I was just talking about your percent kidney function. And also albuminuria category, so protein in the urine. So this has become a big topic in nephrology. So historically, there used to be five stages of chronic kidney disease. So stage one, greater than 90% kidney function. Stage two, 60 to 89% kidney function. It used to be just stage three, from 30 to 59% kidney function. Now 3A and 3B has been um, recommended. So 3A is 45 to 59, and 3B is 30 to 44. Dr. Cobb, this is Dr. Parker. When you talk about 3A, 3B, that's a lot of words for somebody who's not medical, but what does this, what does this mean when you have 3A, 3B? Does that mean we have to start getting dialysis? What does that mean? Not quite yet. So uh, thank you, Dr. Parker. Then stage four, 15 to 29, and stage five, less than 15. So how can somebody have greater than 90% kidney function or 100% kidney function and still have stage one kidney disease. So this is a patient like I probably saw this morning who has lupus nephritis, they have protein in their urine, they have blood in their urine. That's abnormal, but they still have a high kidney function. So when we do the stages, this is how we determine how to treat our patients. Now, if somebody has a high stage and protein or blood in their urine, they need to see a kidney specialist. But the majority of people though, if they have chronic kidney disease due to diabetes or hypertension, they usually get referred to a nephrologist when they get to 3A or 3B, so stage three kidney disease. And there's some recommendations now that possibly referring patients when they get to stage four. Personally, I like to see patients before they get to 29% kidney function. We usually start talking about dialysis when people get to kidney failure or stage five, less than 15% kidney function. I always tell the patient, we treat the patient, we, we don't treat by the numbers. I have patients with six and 7% kidney function who I see in clinic who still hasn't started dialysis. But we usually will talk about dialysis when people get to stage five. And the big thing that they recommend is start checking the protein in the urine in all patients. And the reason that we make a big deal about the protein in the urine, if two patients have both 45% kidney function, the patient who has 45% kidney function with no protein in the urine versus the one who has 45% kidney function and a lot of protein in the urine, the one with the most protein in the urine has a better prognosis or progress to higher stages of kidney disease or have higher chances of going to need dialysis, unfortunately. So the prevalence, CKD, chronic kidney disease in the United States, this is from a big study in Haynes, it was about 13%, but still all studies pretty much show in the United States about 13 to 15% of adults have chronic kidney disease, which is a lot. We're talking about 26 to 30 million people in the United States with chronic kidney disease. And this picture is showing also people in the green, the people with higher kidney function, less protein, the people who do the worst are the people who have a lower kidney function and a lot of protein in their urine. And this is looking at CKD stage five, almost needing dialysis, looking at by ethnicity or race. So compared to Caucasian patients, pretty much all minorities, Hispanic, Asian, Native American, Black, have higher rates of kidney failure compared to others. And Black or African American patients have the highest, almost four times the odds of needing dialysis compared to others in the US. So the most common reasons why people have kidney failure or need dialysis in the U.S., diabetes is number one by far. Over 50% of the people in the U.S. are on dialysis or have chronic kidney disease due to diabetes. Hypertension, number two, 27%. With marital nephritis, these are some inflammatory special things in the kidney. Actually, something I have an interest in and see a lot in my clinic. 
So those are patients with things like lupus. They can have lupus nephritis or in their kidneys. Over 50% of patients with lupus would get kidney disease. Patients with HIV are higher rates of having special type of inflammatory conditions in the kidney. Yes, Dr. Parker. A lot of our listeners have these different diagnoses. And um, just to go back a slide, not to go back, but when you get protein in your urine, um, how, when do we start to get worried? I'm, I'm listening to you and I can kind of halfway follow you, but when do you start to get worried? Like diabetes does cause our kidneys not to work well. At what stage should we be alarmed? If I have a urinary tract infection, am I not going to have protein in my urine? If I'm on my period, am I not going to have protein in my urine? So most patients, Definitely, we start worrying about when they get to stage three. So that's less than, let me go back. When you get to stage three, less than 59% kidney function. And the protein in the urine, so you made a good point. Somebody on their cycle, somebody with a urinary tract infection could have protein in the urine on and off. It's when someone has persistent protein in the kidney, in the urine, they definitely need to be seen by a nephrologist. Um, and get worked up for this consistent protein in the persistent protein in the urine. Then after we talk about the special things like lupus, HIV that cause the inflammation in the kidneys, then you have the other category. So these are things like polycystic kidney disease, which is usually genetic, where someone has a family history of people having large cysts or a lot of cysts on their kidneys. One that people don't think about sometimes medications like you take over the counter like incense, Motrin, Advil, Aleve, Bitty powders, BC powder, they all decrease the blood flow going to the kidney. So these could be associated with um, kidney disease. People often talk about blockages in the blood vessels in the heart and coronary artery disease, but you also can get blockages in the blood vessels going to the kidneys also. So people who have like renal artery stenosis where their blood flow is limited going to the kidneys that also can fall in that other category. But diabetes, number one, high blood pressure, number two, then the special inflammatory things, number three, then the other category um, is the fourth category. So chronic kidney disease risk factors, diabetes, number one, hypertension or high blood pressure, having coronary artery disease, obesity, genetics, so a family history of chronic kidney disease, older age, as a part of aging, all of us probably lose about one milliliter per minute or 1% of kidney function, probably above the age of about 60. So there's some normal loss of kidney function with aging, but it's my job when I see a patient who's older about trying to figure out how much is a normal amount of just aging versus something that's more rapid due to uncontrolled diabetes, uncontrolled high blood pressure, or something else I have to find. Other risk factors, chronic illnesses like HIV and lupus, nephrotoxin medications, so NSAIDs, Motrin, Advil, Ali, Goody powders. Some chemotherapies, unfortunately, when people have cancer, can um, negatively affect the kidney. Some antibiotics, such as Batrim, can have a negative effect on kidney function if it's used chronically. Now, if antibiotic is used for a short course, like three or four days for UTI, Probably no problem, but some patients are on antibiotics chronically and they have issues. So predictors for progression of kidney disease, going from stage one, two, but going to stage three, getting worse, going to stage four, or going to stage five. So what's your kidney function at baseline? That's probably the biggest one. Having protein in the urine, high blood pressure, race, as I showed earlier, all minorities have increased risk of kidney disease, and African Americans have the highest, or almost four times the odds of needing dialysis. Males have higher risk of kidney disease and progressing to dialysis than females. Advanced age also, obesity and smoking, uh, poor diabetes control, some of the medications as I talked about earlier, such as some of the pain medications, having high cholesterol levels, cardiovascular disease, heart disease, I love the kidney, but if the heart isn't pumping well, somebody has heart failure and not providing blood flow to the kidneys, you go get kidney disease in that way. 
People with liver failure also have increased risk of having kidney disease. So treatment recommendations. So what do you do once you're diagnosed with chronic kidney disease? First thing is to see the nephrologist and try to see why do you have chronic kidney disease? Because the treatment for one is different than the treatment for others. But one thing that we all know is that blood pressure control is very important when trying to keep kidney function from getting any worse. So the recommendation for the long time has been having blood pressure less than 130 over 80 if somebody have chronic kidney disease and a lot of protein in the urine. So I'm talking about 300 milligrams of protein or more, um, that's very worrisome. Now, if somebody has high chronic kidney disease and no protein in the urine, the long-term goal has been blood pressure less than 140 over 90. But things in medicine are really changing. And there's a lot of data out about having stricter um, blood pressure in patients with chronic kidney disease. So even though our guidelines are still less than one third over 80 if somebody has kidney disease and a lot of protein in the urine, or less than one fourth over 90 if they have kidney disease and they don't have a lot of protein in the urine, less than one third over 80 is starting to become the goal for everyone. It's, um, data has shown stricter blood pressure control is better for our patients. One caveat on that, some of our older patients, though, you, you don't want to have the blood pressure too low as they might be at risk for things such as falls and that leads to fractures, hip fractures and things like that. We do have to be careful in some of our patients about dropping their blood pressure too low. Then outside of blood pressure control, there's certain medications that we definitely know helps with kidney disease. So certain types of blood pressure medicine. So like Cinepril is an ACE inhibitor. Losartan is an ARB blood pressure medication. So blood pressure meds like Lysinopril, Enalapril, Losartan, Velsartan, and those categories we know have a, a protective effect on the kidneys. So treating your blood pressure with any med is good to get your blood pressure down, but we know certain blood pressure medications that fall in these categories like Lysinopril and Losartan have an extra protective effect on the kidneys. And something that's really exciting right now is the SGLT2 inhibitors. So these medications have been around for diabetes treatment for a while, but they don't have really showed that these medications are great in kidney disease patients and preventing kidney disease from getting worse. So you've seen the TV commercials for Farsica every night or Jardians every night. So these medications, I think, are really going to add um, to what we can do for kidney disease patients and trying to prevent kidney disease patients, kidney function from getting worse. And this, just talking about a study looking at this was Invokana, one of those medications. I don't expect you to get this, but it shows these medications like Invokana, Jardiance, Farsiga, they help for the heart failure, they help for protein in the urine, they prevent death, and now we know they prevented patients for progressing to needing dialysis. So these medications came out just to treat diabetes, but now we're seeing that they have good heart effects, they have overall uh, life effects, effects on protein in the urine, and now we know they have effects on kidney disease also. Can you talk a little bit about like water pills and... Um taking, you know, taking medicine, let's say for heart failure, that includes a, a water pill, a diuretic of some sort that seems to make our kidney numbers worse. Okay, thank you. So we talked about complications of chronic kidney disease. So the kidneys are very involved when it comes to your body eliminating salt, retaining salt, so when someone has chronic kidney disease, if they didn't have high blood pressure already, as their kidney function get worse, patients will start developing high blood pressure or hypertension. So our chronic kidney disease patients, when their kidney function is greater than 90%, 18% of patients will have high blood pressure. But when their kidney function get less than 30%, 82% of our kidney patients have high blood pressure at that point. So the kidney is definitely very involved in hypertension or high blood pressure. So Dr. Parker was bringing up some of the medications that we use. 
So earlier I brought up Losartan, Lysinopril, which are ACE inhibitors, ARBs. Those medications are great blood pressure medications, but they also have protective effects on the kidney. But then we have other blood pressure medicines too, like calcium channel blockers and uh, things like that. But water pills or diuretics are very good blood pressure medications. So we try to tell everyone to eat a low salt diet, which is less than 2000 milligrams of sodium or salt a day. That could be hard to do, but blood pressure medications like diuretics can help get rid of the sodium or the salt in the body and help control the blood pressure. Now, some of our patients who have severe kidney disease or have heart failure have to be on very high levels of diuretics. At that point, sometimes it's hard finding a balance between having too much fluid on and having too much fluid taken off. So sometimes patients can get dry when they have high levels of diuretics and that can affect their kidney function or make their kidney function get worse. This morning, I have a patient who's 87 who I've been following for years, recently developed heart failure. And I have to be careful when we go up and down her diuretics or her water pills because if she's short of breath, we'll go up on the dose, but oftentimes that'll dry her out and it'll make her kidney function go in the wrong direction. So we have to be careful with diuretics in our patients. So other complications of kidney disease, anemia. Most people probably don't know, but the hormones that make your bone marrow make red blood cells is produced in the kidney, so EPO. So with kidney function, at 90%, 4% of our patients with kidney disease have anemia, but by the time they get to stage four, over half of our patients with chronic kidney disease have anemia. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is activated in the kidney. So by the time you get to stage four kidney disease, 27% of our patients have vitamin D deficiency. Your kidney cleans your blood, filters your blood. So things like acid can build up when you have kidney disease. About 31.5%, almost a third of our patients will have acid build up by the time they get to stage four kidney disease. Things such as phosphorus, which is in the foods you eat and things that you drink. 23% of patients will have high phosphorus by the time they get to stage four kidney disease. Then parathyroid hormone, which affects your bones, also is very high um, having those complications in patients with kidney disease. So talking about treatment of chronic kidney disease, you treat the blood pressure, you use certain medications, there's new medications out like the SGLT2 inhibitors like Sega and Jardiance. But also, the main reason people with chronic kidney disease die is actually from heart disease. They don't make it to need in dialysis. So we have 26 million people with chronic kidney disease in the United States, but only about 700,000 people are on dialysis. Maybe the primary care doctors and nephrologists who treat these patients so great, they're not making it to dialysis, but unfortunately these patients are dying from heart disease. So we really take cholesterol control big in kidney disease. So a bad cholesterol LDL go less than 100. And also the medications that we use, like the statins to treat cholesterol also may have some protective effects in the kidney. So unfortunately, I'm treating somebody with chronic kidney disease. They progress from stage one to stage two to stage three to stage four. We have to start talking about dialysis when people get to stage five. But just because you get to stage five doesn't mean you need to start dialysis right away. So there was a big trial looking at early versus late initiation of dialysis. People did better when you waited to start dialysis until they had an issue. The acid buildup could treat treated them more their potassium became high, they became fluid overloaded and I couldn't, they wasn't responding to diuretics anymore. Well, another one that we talk about is uremia, the BUN. So BUN or urea is a toxin. Your kidney is supposed to get rid of it. It can build up in patients. And then when it builds up, patients can lose their appetite. They can say food doesn't taste good. They can get confused. They can get some cognitive impairment where they have problems with memory. And they actually think that's one of the reasons patients with kidney disease have a lot of Alzheimer's and other dementia might be because of the buildup of toxins such as urea. 
So we start preparing people for dialysis when they get to stage five. Uh, this is an example of a patient on hemodialysis. They have a fistula in their arm and their blood circles through, through that machine. Most patients stay on the hemodialysis machine three and a half to four and a half hours, three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, or Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday, and, Friday, and Saturday. So risk factors for dementia and risk factors for chronic kidney disease. So things that put you at risk, a lot of these things are the same on both sides. So genetics, family history for dementia, hypertension for dementia, diabetes, smoking, high cholesterol, older age, having heart disease, coronary artery disease, having a history of stroke, obesity, being inactive, chronic illnesses such as HIV and lupus, chronic kidney disease is a big risk factor for dementia, and certain medications. Chronic kidney disease, diabetes number one risk factor, hypertension number two, coronary artery disease or heart disease, obesity, genetics of family history, older age, chronic illnesses such as HIV and lupus, and taking certain medications that are bad to the kidney. We call them nephrotoxin meds, such as the pain medicines, such as Motrin, Advil, and Leave, Goody Pops, which could be bad on the kidney. Now, I know that Alzheimer's, people talk about apolipoproteins. Y'all might have heard of that. Um, and those proteins might be associated with Alzheimer's. Same thing in the kidney. Apolipoprotein 1, which is a protein, has been associated with kidney disease in black patients. So as I talked about kidney disease in black patients, four times the odds of others with needing dialysis. Patients with this new genetic type of kidney disease, I'm actually participating in a study where we have patients with a special type of kidney disease, African-American patients get checked for this genetic defect. These patients um, definitely have very high rates of kidney disease. And it seems like it's patients with a West African descent, um, higher rates of having this APOL1 or APOLipoprotein. It's an exciting time, but I think we now know why African-Americans might have higher rates of kidney disease compared to others, and also some possible treatments are in the pipeline. And I want to finish by talking about um, kidney disease and dementia. So this study was looking at dialysis patients, and they looked at... Um, Neurocognitive tests, looking at mild cognitive impairment, severe cognitive impairment, problems with memory, uh, dementia. Majority of the patients either had mild, moderate, or severe. Only about 30% of the patients ha had a normal um, neurocognitive test on hemodialysis. And there's been no numerous studies that have shown that same thing, that having kidney failure, very high rates, of memory loss, cognitive impairment, dementia. And we think definitely has something to do with the toxins building up, the urea, but also maybe has something to do with blood pressure too. Blood pressures go very high and low on our dialysis patients quite often, and also in our patients with chronic kidney disease. So this study here was looking at patients with chronic kidney disease who are not on dialysis, and patients who had blood pressure variability, where your blood pressure goes from like, on the top number from 120 up to 160. Next time you go see the doctor, 180. The next time you see a doctor. So patients who have these big swings in their blood pressure have increased risk of having chronic kidney disease, but they also have increased risk of having dementia. And this variability of blood pressure has also been shown in other studies looking at dementia. But even worse, in patients with chronic kidney disease, if they have this blood pressure that's going up and down, high rates of having any dementia, Alzheimer's, or vascular dementia are up in these patients. And this is a study, one of the big um, uh, hemodialysis study, and they were looking at the prevalence of um, an abnormal mini mental state exam by having cognitive impairment, signs of dementia. And you see with age, it goes up as suspected, but it's over half the patients by the time they get to the age 85. And they reported on the mini mental exam up to 40% of patients by the time they got to the age of 75. 
And as we know, the South is known as a stroke belt and very high rates of these patients having stroke in the United States. Um, in, in our, this was instead of looking at kidney disease patients and they adjusted for different things, but all these, every time, the South is the high rates of dialysis patients um, who have strokes. And we definitely know that strokes put patients with kidney disease at risk for dementia. We call that vascular dementia that patients have from having strokes and um, decreased blood flow going to parts of their um, brain. And definitely dialysis patients and chronic kidney disease patients in the South have higher risk of strokes compared to others. Dr. Cobb, there are a couple of questions. Oh, I'm sorry. That um, have asked about fluids and like how much water should you drink? What color should my urine be? And I guess they're trying to self-diagnose to some degree. So, okay. um, well, can you read those? How much water. <laughs> and does this make a difference? Am I going to get kidney failure if I don't drink enough water? Okay. Um, so water. I love water. It has no calories in it and it has no sodium in it. And there are studies that have looked at patients who have repeated dehydration. So they have looked at studies of people and migrant farm workers. No other reason for chronic kidney disease, but they get dehydrated over and over and over working each day. And they have high rates of kidney disease and needing dialysis. So drinking fluids is great. I would say at least a liter liter and try to get up to a liter and a half if you can of water each day. Cause like I said, no salt, no calories. We love it. Um, I, also, when you look at your urine, you can have other reasons, but majority of the time if a urine is dark, it's usually because of dehydration. So you definitely need to drink more water um, on those days that you're um, dehydrated and getting dehydrated on a regular basis does put you at risk of kidney disease. Yeah, I'm going to be a little gross here. So when you say dehydrated, if your urine is dark, in medical yes. terms, dark means tea color. Does it look like iced tea? If your urine is that dark, you need to drink some more. Your urine, that's, pretty, that's pretty severe. <laughs> it is, but urine should be clear, clear, very pale, like pale lemonade, and clear, not cloudy, clear, faintly yep. Now, some patients will say beer. Even if it's dark beer color, they're still probably too concentrated. You need to drink more water than that. Now, tea color is definitely their stream. It shouldn't be brown. Shouldn't be brown at all. It should be light, pale yellow and clear. If it's cloudy, that may mean something else, but it should be clear. Thank you, Dr. Cobb. I know and, it's a and, gross question, but that's well, in the chat. And a cloudy urine worry about these like infections, so definitely let us know. And if it's very bubbly, a foamy on top, could be more protein in your urine. So that's something I was gonna bring up at the end. So we do these health screenings in the community um, where we check blood pressure, we check the blood sugar, um, but we start checking the urine. A lot of patients will do a physical and they'll have their urine checked for protein in the urine. We really, really know that Checking for protein in the urine is important because that might be the first sign of kidney disease before you start having your creatinine go up and you start developing chronic kidney disease on your GFR. So make sure your doctor is checking your urine at least once a year also so we won't miss anything and we can catch it early. And if you can read some of the other questions also. Should you be drinking more water if you're taking a water pill? Okay, so it depends on what we're talking about. If you're taking a hydrochlorothiazide or a amount of water pill for blood pressure, drinking a normal amount of water is fine. But if you are a kidney patient or a heart failure patient, and we're using the high doses of diuretics to try to get fluid off of your heart and get fluid out of your body, you might be defeating the purpose by drinking too much water. So we often put patients with severe kidney disease or heart failure on a fluid restriction and we'll tell you to drink a lower amount of water. But if it's just a lower amount, a small water pill just for blood pressure, drinking a normal amount of water is fine. 
Does it matter what kind of water you drink? Alkaline water, pH water? And you said water is clear, but there are all kinds of water that are marketed. What kind of water should we be drinking? There we go. I said the regular water, the tap water, the cheapest water you can find. I know people are buying the smart water, other waters are costing like three or four dollars a bottle. Um, so I mentioned one of the complications of kidney disease could be acid buildup in the blood, but this is later in chronic kidney disease. So I think that's the concept they're trying to go off of, that they're giving you something basic and something like the alkaline water. Um, if you can afford it, drink the alkaline water, but just drinking regular water is fine also. Okay, that, that's really, really helpful because there are a lot of questions in the chat. I'm, sh I'm shouting them out because I'm, they come up a lot. One person says, I prefer tap water, but it's good to know that we can drink tap water. Yeah, it's fine. It's um, the cheapest one, especially with inflation. <laughs> yeah. There is another question in here about dialysis for yes. people who are undergoing dialysis. And as a primary care doctor, I've had people have the uh, shunts placed in the arm before they need dialysis. And I'm like, but they don't need dialysis now. So at what point in time is it that we talk about somebody needing dialysis and should you go to a dialysis center versus home dialysis? What's the difference? I grew up with a lot of people who had home dialysis. They had tubs in their house for dialysis. What's the difference? So I was limiting the chronic kidney disease. I know I had a time on top, but I could really go into dialysis all day. Um, they want to so talk. I'm answering all their questions. They're really into this today. Thank you. So on the Stages of kidney disease, stage one, the mildest, stage two, three, four. When you get to severe stage four, less than about 20%, I need to really start talking to my patient about getting ready for dialysis. Not saying that you need to start, but possibly about getting ready for dialysis. So the recommendation when you mentioned the shunt, that fistula in the arm, they recommend if you think someone will be on dialysis within a year about getting the fistula placed because all the fistulas, when they put that shunt in the arm, don't work. And even if one works, it takes about three to four months for that fistula to heal in a way that it could be used. Um, so we usually say try to prepare within a year. But we really start talking about dialysis when people get to stage five. I was saying that study that showed starting early versus starting late, people did better when they started late. So just because your kidney function is less than 15% does not mean we need to start dialysis. But if it becomes unsafe, your uremia is building up, you lose your appetite, you get malnourished, your potassium is high, I can't control the fluid with the diuretics. That's when you need to start dialysis, when you start having symptoms that we can't control um, with medications. Now, we talked about dialysis as shown in the arm. In the United States, about 90% of patients are doing dialysis in the center with, with the shun in the arm if they can, but majority of patients, are, unfortunately, they start dialysis with these catheters that go into the neck. We really don't like the catheters, and that's why we try to put the shun in the arm or the fistula in the arm early, because patients do better when they have a breath of fistula compared to having that catheter in the neck. The catheter in the neck is associated with increased risk of death, increased risk of infections. So that's why you'll see somebody get a fistula in, even though they don't need to start dialysis right now. Then home dialysis. My clinic, about a third of my patients are doing dialysis at home. So they have the shunt in their arm, they have a, someone in their house, they stick their arm themselves, someone has to be in the house with them, they do dialysis five or six days a week, we call that home hemodialysis. But the majority of my patients though, who are doing dialysis at home are doing peritoneal dialysis, where they get a catheter put in their belly, it only involves fluid, it doesn't involve blood at all, and you can be single on peritoneal dialysis. There's no risk of your blood pressure dropping. There's no risk of bleeding. So patients on peritoneal dialysis um, could be single. A lot of my patients are younger or single with, um, with lupus arthritis in my clinic, and a lot of them would do dialysis at home. So patients do better with dialysis at home. Um, the risk of um, 
disability and being able to, patients are able to work more when they do dialysis at home. It's cheaper for the overall healthcare system when people do dialysis at home and patients have better outcomes doing dialysis at home. Oh, and then I always tell patients dialysis is not their final destination. Um, kidney transplant should be patient's final or um, destination. And we can start working somebody up for a kidney transplant when they get less than 20% kidney function. But on that note, when it comes to kidney replacement or kidney transplants, don't you have to meet certain age criteria and overall mm -hmm. fitness criteria? So most places have a cutoff at 75 years of age. Um, also fitness, I have a patient right now who had heart failure with a heart valve. They, and they said she was unfit in 2022. She just had a heart valve fits in January of this year. And now they're saying she's fit as a candidate for transplant. And she has CKD, chronic kidney disease. She's not on dialysis yet. So hopefully I can get her transplanted before she ever needs dialysis. Also, the big one outside of being fit medically is weight. Um, your BMI has to be less than 35 for a kidney transplant. So that's your body mass and that's your weight compared to your height. There are several questions in the chart talking about um, gout and chronic kidney disease and the keto diet. Um, okay. People who eat too much protein may have an exacerbation of gout. So can you kind of tie that into kidney function? And kidney disease puts you at risk for gout. One of the things that kidney help regulate is uric acid. So when that uric acid builds up, when you have chronic kidney disease, you have increased risk of gout in chronic kidney disease patients. Um, and the last part was about... Keto diet. Keto diet. Protein diet. So I'm plus or minus on the keto diet. Um, when patients have early chronic kidney disease, I'm okay with them doing the keto diet. But the issue when people get to stage three, four, and five, one of the complications of chronic kidney disease I put up was acidosis, which is acid buildup in your blood. It can get really bad in patients with chronic kidney disease. If you already can't filter out the acid appropriately, I've seen patients get really, really, really acidotic with the keto diet. So if you have a moderate or severe chronic kidney disease, I don't recommend the keto diet. Then the other thing, early CKD, I don't really restrict patients' protein, but when patients get to more severe kidney disease, I restrict the protein a lot. I tell patients no more than the palm of their hand on their protein intake, they can help bring down the urea. Our protein is broken down into urea. So urea is one of the toxins that your kidneys uh, are having a hard time uh, filtering or one of the hard time removing the toxins. So I don't really recommend the keto diet in moderate or severe chronic kidney disease. Okay, there are a couple of other questions in here about what can you do to reduce the protein in the urine? I've explained in one of them that um, when your kidneys aren't working well, you start to leak protein. Can you talk about this a little bit more? Because I think people are misunderstanding protein in the urine. They think it's something they're eating, they're drinking, and they're not quite understanding why protein is in their urine. Oh, yeah. Pro everybody has protein in their blood. And it's supposed to only be in your blood. So when your kidneys are damaged, you will leak protein in your urine. It depends on the cause. If you have diabetes, it's uncontrolled. It will damage your kidneys and make you leak protein in the urine. So get your diabetes under control. If you have high blood pressure and the blood pressure is too high, it will damage your kidneys and make protein leak in your urine. Get the blood pressure under control. If you have kidney disease for any cause, using those medications like lisinopril or Losartan, those blood pressure medicines help decrease the protein in the urine. Um, SGLT2 inhibitors, the new medications like Farsiga and Jardians, um, they will definitely help um, with the protein in the urine. Now, I tell most patients, though, you're probably not eating such a significant amount of protein the, the, to do that. Um, it's treating the underlying cause, get your blood pressure control, get your blood sugar control. 
Can you say something about the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like naproxen, Advil, and what their effect on the kidney is? So I mentioned this nephrotoxic or damaging drugs. So all of those things, BC powder, Goody, Motrin, Advil, Lee, what they actually do, they decrease the blood flow going to the kidneys. So they can definitely damage your kidneys and make your creatinine go up and make you have chronic kidney disease. But they also can make your um, kidneys leak protein too. So that's another way that those medications could damage your kidneys. And when you're taking those medicines, consuming more water? Consuming more water probably will help. I would say be careful with the amount you're taking in. If you don't have kidney disease, I will still use those medications only as needed, sparingly. That will help prevent kidney disease. Now, if you have chronic kidney disease already, I said don't use them at all. Okay, everybody, you got that? Advil, naproxen. Um, I had somebody this morning on diclofenac. They yeah. were doing it every day. Those are medicines that are usually prescribed for arthritis, osteoarthritis, like meloxicam is another one. Um, those are what we call non-steroidal, which means not a steroid, not cortisone, steroid medications to stop inflammation, uh, frequently given in people who have osteoarthritis. So being careful about how much of that medicine you're taking, taking just the amount that's necessary to relieve your pain and not overdosing, overdoing it can kind of help damage your kidney. So you're not supposed to take more than three grams of, um, uh, Tylenol, for example, a day, but a lot of people take more than that and they think they're doing better, but you're hurting things when you take them against what the recommended dose is. I know some patients say, well, doc, you tell me to stop all the incest and only I can take is Tylenol, but then you tell me to be careful with Tylenol. Just like you mentioned, if you do too much of the Tylenol, you can affect the liver and that can affect the kidneys. They're all tied together, but we do prefer Tylenol versus the other ones for kidney patients. Okay. Um, okay. We've talked about Losartan and there are a couple of questions in here that are a little redundant. I'm appreciative of all 233 of you paying attention here. Um, but some of these questions have been answered before and, um, you know, is kidney disease progression inevitable? So I'm a diabetic, for example, and I've been told I have stage three uh, kidney disease. Does that mean that I'm going to progress to four or five and actually have to have dialysis? What does that mean? No, the majority of patients by far do not progress to dialysis. Now, don't beat yourself up. Some patients will just progress. And we didn't quite know why. But now I think some patients it might be genetics why some patients are progressing versus others. But the majority of patients by far will not progress to stage from stage three to four to stage five or to kidney failure and knee dialysis. So control your diabetes, use medications to help protect the kidneys like lisinopril or Losartan or possibly your SGLT2 inhibitors like Farsiga or Jardians. There are things that we can do, diet and exercise, loss, lose weight um, to help progress, help decrease the progression of the kidney disease. Majority of my patients by far do not progress to dialysis. Okay, and um, there's a question here. Um, um, what are the most important questions to ask your doctor about monitoring your kidney disease? I mean, if you've been told you have kidney disease, chances are they're checking it. The big things that we need to check if we're diabetic and hypertension, things that we need to make sure that our doctor checks, Dr. Cobb. Our urine for one? Check your urine for protein and get your lab work checked for the creatinine. So and from the creatinine, they put it into the GFR or your percent kidney function. So those are your main labs to get checked at least once a year. At and if you have chronic kidney disease already, you need to be checked more often. So if I'm hypertensive, do you still recommend getting seen by your doctor every three to four months and getting those the urine and the creatinine checked quarterly at least? Um, if you... Do not have chronic kidney disease at least once a year when it comes to um, the blood work in the year. Now, if you have chronic kidney disease, definitely more often. Okay, so there's a question in there about BUN, blood urea nitrogen. That's a okay. measure 
kidney function, right? Can you explain that, Dr. Cobb? Somebody's asked that question. So some of the toxins we talked about, you got the creatinine, which is the main one. The, the BUN or urea is probably the second most important one. And when that builds up, people lose the appetite. Food doesn't taste good. Um, they lose, they get fatigued. They can have memory loss. And it's definitely been associated with dementia. So that's something that we monitor. Um, and once you own the houses, we try to clean. That's one of the things we measure to see how good of a job I'm doing cleaning your blood. Okay. There's a question here. Is neurocognitive disease or dementia rule uh, make you less eligible for having a transplant? Yes. Okay. And there it is. That's one of the comorbidities, yeah, that when they say maybe fit or not fit, yes. Okay. Can urine, can you clear urine overnight if you're a controlled diabetic patient? I don't understand the question, but I guess they're wanting to make sure that their urine should be clear overnight. Like if they get oh, up. Oh, so the most common reason that if you're doing a great job drinking water, your urine should be clear. But overnight, if you sleep for eight or nine hours, when you first wake up, that might be your most concentrated urine is the one when you first wake up. So you could drink more before you go to bed. That maybe it wouldn't be as concentrated that first one. Okay, and there's one last question and we'll let you, we, we're, you've been great. You've talked a long time and they ask a lot of questions. Um, is there any genetic predisposition to developing kidney disease? I think that's a little different from the question Mr. Hutchinson asks, but he's talking about genetics. Like, are there, is there a higher incidence of kidney disease in one group of people versus another? Right, so black patients have the highest, but all minorities in the U.S. have higher rates of kidney disease. And APOL1, which might, I mean, it's another apolipo protein, just like the apolipo protein associated with Alzheimer's, is definitely associated with kidney disease in African American patients. Okay, and being African American doesn't mean that there's a genetic problem. It may be some of the diseases that you're affected with that are more likely to occur in black people. So I want to get that one out there. There are some genetic disorders that are associated with chronic kidney disease. Like I wanna say polycystic uh, kidney disease. There's a genetic predisposition. You don't have to be black or white. Can you talk to them a little bit about that, Dr. Cobb? Okay. So there's a lot of genetic kidney diseases out there but the most common one we know about APOL1 in African Americans now but uh, polycystic kidney diseases in that other group, when you get these large cysts on the kidneys, that usually runs in family. It's very rare that it's a new mutation, but it usually they have a strong family history of having those cysts. And if you have a family history of polycystic kidney disease, you should be um, tested more frequently than regular people for chronic kidney disease. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Cobb, for taking the time and being with us. Megan, you have two minutes, but Dr. Cobb, we're going to be calling on you again because they got a whole bunch of questions in here. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. Megan? Okay. <laughs> thank you for a few moments. I'm learning so much, and um, I just, I'm just i really appreciating everybody's enthusiasm about the session today as well. Um, well, my name's Megan, and um, I work for a program at Emory called the Cognitive Empowerment Program. It's a year-long research study for people who have a diagnosis of MCI and their care partners to come into our uh, clinic, a real learning lab at Emory, and do uh, different activities and things that they recommend for empowerment, for uh, really keeping and managing lifestyle changes. Um, and today we have a webinar right after Brain Talk Live. We recommend 150 exercise uh, minutes a week. And if you want to get in about 45 minutes of really accessible exercise that you can do either standing or seated, uh, join us in the link that I just posted in the chat. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and I'll pass it back to you, Dr. Parker. Thank you, Megan. Um, Dr. Parker, before we depart, uh, we want to do a little bit of post housekeeping to let everyone know all of the great programs we have coming up. And guys, remember, this is being recorded. We went through a ton of information. So you have to go back and go to YouTube and re-watch 
and take notes. That's why we remind you to take notes because it's a lot of content, right? But you have some marching orders. You have two or three things you can do yourself to improve your kidney function. So Dr. Parker, I'm going to pull up the slide about um, the Minority Men's Health Program and our Disparities Conference because we did send out invitations about that. And so there's a couple of different audiences that we target mm -hmm. with our outreach and recruitment. Okay. So um, Mrs. Dorbin is talking. I know we're a couple of minutes over, but um, in two weeks, we're going to be hosting a conference on the social, environmental, and biological determinants of dementia disparities. It's a lot, but it's like why people of one group have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's or related dementia versus another group. So if you're really interested in the science and where we are in terms of research and how we're working on this, please join us in this conference on March 23rd and 24th. It's gonna be here on the Emory campus. You can register um, at ddconference.fiu.edu or you can call 404-712-1416 and we will register for you. You. This is going to be a conference featuring a lot of very national speakers from other institutions, Emory, Johns Hopkins, Harvard. We've got people from all over the country discussing this. And it's why Alzheimer's affects one group more so than the other and the state of our research here. On this Thursday, we're having a minority men's health discussion with Dr. Jerison Williams, who is a surgeon, who's going to talk about what you can do to be a better patient and how to take control of your health. So if you are a man of color, we want you in our audience, and there is a link in the chat for that. Um, and next week, um, I am part of the Educating America Tour for the Alzheimer's Foundation of America. If you are a person who is having a problem with how your brain works, or you are a caregiver for somebody with Alzheimer's or related dementia, next Wednesday from 10 to 1, we are having a forum at the Miller Ward Alumni House here on Emory's campus. This is a free research, free session, free seminar from 10 to one. I'll be on it. Um, there's gonna be an elder care attorney. There's gonna be a gerontologist from the University of Georgia who's gonna talk about what resources are available in the community for those of us living in Georgia to help with this. So that's the Alzheimer's Foundation of America tour. And then there is one last community event that we're doing. We're doing a wellness expo at uh, Greenbrier Mall with um, the Atlanta Lynx. But we've got all these things on our website. We really want to see you at our Educating America tour or in our Disparities Conference. If you are so inclined, we'd really like you to come join us here on the Emory campus at the Miller Ward Alumni House. Um, in any event, um, please register. We'll, we'll, we'll be talking to you again. Look at our website, join our discussion groups and learn a little bit more. You're gonna find more about the resources we have available. And of course, as always, we're the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. We want you enrolled in a clinical research study that's here on our campus or anywhere else. I just need you to be enrolled in research so that you become a better consumer of healthcare and you learn how to take better care of yourself. So with that, I will end. And thank you for joining us today.